Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mark's Community Church. My name is Pete Stearns and I'm one of our pastors here and I'm thrilled to be continuing this conversation on the book of Ephesians. We've been looking at this little word, therefore. It's a little word that has a significant impact in our life and is peppered throughout Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. Every time Paul writes this word, therefore, he does so as an invitation to respond to the gospel message. And so today we're going to be looking at one of those gospel truths and we're going to ask ourselves, how is the therefore calling us into a new way of transformation in our life? Well, on Mother's Day, I received a gift from one of our very thoughtful congregants. And I know I probably shouldn't have been getting gifts on Mother's Day, but it's just how the timing worked out. You see, Christy and I uh, both have roots in the Chicago area, and so oftentimes in the lobby, we talk about some of our favorite Chicago staples, like deep dish pizza or Chicago hot dogs. Uh, And she had just come back from a trip visiting relatives in Chicago, and on that trip, she had been inspired to bring me uh, a, a very thoughtful gift, really kind of the crown jewel of Chicago junk food culinary space, right? An Italian beef sandwich from Portillo's. Now, if you're not familiar with Italian beef, it's basically the Midwest attempt uh, at, at, at barbecue, right? But, but we're not able to stand out by the grill during uh, the year because it's so frigid. And so instead of being cooked for long hours on the grill or in the smoker, it's cooked for long hours into some giant pot of stew and peppers and spices. But it just absorbs all of this remarkable flavor. And, and it's kind of one of these sandwiches that melts in your mouth. And and so I was ecstatic when, when Christy brought me this gift. I couldn't wait to get home and eat it, but it was Mother's Day, and, and I had a couple of sermons to preach. And so I quickly ran, and I placed that lovely gift in the bottom of the freezer in the kitchen here just outside of our lobby. And, and then I went, and I hopped up on stage, and I preached, and then I, I shook a bunch of hands in between services, and then I preached again, and I shook a bunch of hands, and then I looked at the time, And I realized that, uh, as per usual, I was running a little bit late. Uh, But unlike most Sundays, it was Mother's Day. And so I really had to hustle to get out of there in order to go into all the plans that we had to celebrate Brittany that afternoon. And in my hurry... I left that uh, deep or that that Italian beef in the bottom of the freezer, and and not only did I leave it that day, but also the next day, and then the day after, and the day after that, and the day after, and and for weeks it sat in that freezer. I had completely forgotten about this wonderfully thoughtful gift until about four days ago, when Christy brought me another gift. Another gift of food that you all are probably a little bit more familiar with. I came into my office one morning, and there sitting on my desk was one of her incredible pound cakes. How many of us have had the pound cake in the Mission Cafe? Well, I had an entire thing of it sitting on my desk. And instead of the normal excitement that I might feel when I saw this, instead my heart plummeted into my stomach as I realized that I had forgotten about the Italian beef. And if I had forgotten about the Italian beef, that meant that I didn't get the joy of experiencing it. And if I didn't have the joy of experiencing it, it meant that I had forgotten to offer my gratitude for just this wonderful present that I had received. And and so needless to say, I had Italian beef this week, right? It, 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 it keeps pretty well in the freezer, and so I enjoyed a, a couple Italian beef sandwiches on Friday and, and, and spent a good deal of time apologizing to Christy for forgetting about it. But, but here's the thing. In order to enjoy the fruits of a gift, you have to remember that the gift exists, Right, that's pretty essential in order to, uh, to really experience the impact of a gift. If it's buried in the freezer, it does no good for you. Well, the same is true about 
the gospel message. When we receive this gift of salvation that comes to us through Christ Jesus, it's tempting for us to store it away in a place where it is safe and it will be kept for a long time. But the further and further we get away from that moment, the more tempted we are to forget it's there. And when we forget the gift of salvation, we find ourselves not experiencing the fruit of the wonderful grace and mercy of our God. And so today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be studying the character of that gift of salvation. And we're going to be responding to Paul's invitation to place it centrally in our lives. So let's open up into Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us, also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, before we go on, let's take a moment just to sit in this remarkable truth. Paul is talking uh, to a group of believers that would have been considered Gentiles at this time. Now, if you're not familiar with, with what Gentiles are, basically Gentiles were anyone that was not of a Jewish descent. Anyone outside of the covenant family that we studied here in the book of Genesis, those that were not God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, were seen as Gentiles. And as Gentiles, they were not worthy of receiving the blessings of God. But as we saw last week, when Jesus Christ came and redeemed us of our sins, he became the blessing that was to be to all nations. In Christ Jesus, everyone on earth was drawn into the kingdom of God. And so Paul talks to this group of Gentiles here in Ephesus, and he tells them that before Jesus came, they were dead in their transgressions, dead in their sins. Now, I find it really important to recognize that Paul calls them dead. He does not say that they were lost. He does not say that they were wandering. He does not say that they were in the dark. He does not say that they were off the mark. Why? Because each of those things would allude to the possibility of finding their way. If you are lost, you can stumble into the right path. If you are wandering in the darkness, your eyes will become adjusted. If you are simply off the mark, the more you try, the closer you will get. But Paul says no. It's not that you are simply lost. There is a finality to the state of life that you find yourself in. Because of your sin, you are dead. And if you are dead, you are completely helpless and hopeless. If you are dead, it is only by the work of a miracle that you might breathe life. And that very miracle is the gift of God's grace to be a blessing to all nations. While they were sinners, Christ died for them. While they were dead, Christ resuscitated them and brings us to life. The fruit of the gift of God's grace and mercy is that this gift produces in us life when instead we should be defined by death. And it's from this platform that Paul continues in verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
And so as Paul continues, he, he, he starts to call out some, some new characteristics of this gift of grace and mercy that produces salvation in us. He, he identifies all believers that claim Jesus Christ as the handiwork of God. And this is a very intentional picture that Paul is using here. Oftentimes when Paul talks about handiwork, he is referring to the work of a potter. In fact, we're going to see that illustration multiple times throughout the epistles, the letters that Paul writes to the church, likening us as the creation of God to clay and God as the creator as the potter. And there's something that's beautiful that happens when we understand ourselves as the handiwork of a potter. Not only do we recognize our beauty in the characteristics of our God, but also our use in his purposes for us. You see, a potter takes a lump of clay, something that is nothing, and he makes it beautiful, but also they make it useful. They give it a purpose. Without the potter, clay becomes dried out, cracked. It, it, it turns into to dust, into nothingness, but in the hands of the potter, it is formed. And it is marked by their creative intellect. It is brought into life, and it finds value in the hands of that potter. And so there's something beautiful that happens here. You see, Paul recognizes that, yes, we have been brought to life by Christ, but this is not just a one-time gift. It's not just a second chance in life that says, okay, I'm going to let you start anew, and now it's up to you. But instead, it, it articulates a life of humble dependency upon God. A life of humble dependency on how God will form us next. And as being identified as the handiwork of God, we are given ongoing value. You see, the, the produce, the effect of the gift of God's grace and mercy is that, yes, we would have life. But in humble dependence, we would also have value, purpose. And meaning. And so here in this space, Paul gives us this beautiful picture of, of what it is that this gift of salvation can do for us. He speaks to the transformation of God's grace and God's mercy. He articulates that this is a gift that has been given freely to us. Why? So that no one can boast. It is a gift that is ongoing. It is a gift that is transformative. It is a gift that forms us into vessels for our... Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember... That at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. I'll be honest, this feels a little bit odd to me. We have one of the most beautiful poetic statements of the gospel truth and it's followed by an invitation to remember that we once lived a life that was hopeless and without God. It, it, it doesn't seem to live up to the billing of the truth. In fact, it, it in some ways feels like somewhat of a threat. Like this idea that, that I brought you into this world, so don't you forget I can take you out of it. But I wonder if Paul is urging the church of Ephesus to remember the gift of the gospel because if they forget it, if they leave it in the freezer, it is of no use to them. If they forget about the character of that gospel, they are robbed of life. They are devoid of value. 
And see, he calls them to remember this gift. Because it is only in remembering it can they taste the sweetness of Christ's salvation. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I think about forgetting as passive. It's, it's accidental. It's unintentional. And, and because of that, it becomes a, a pretty good excuse for me. I mean, a, a, occasionally I, I commit to doing something around the home by a specific deadline. And, and, and every once in a while, not often, that deadline comes and goes, and I have not completed that which I said I would. And Brittany uh, sometimes comes to me and, and articulates some of her frustration and my inability to have performed that which I committed to do. And, and more often than not, here's what I say, I'm so sorry, I just forgot. And, and if she still seems irritated, I get real flustered and defensive, and I say, what do you want me to do? It was an accident. I didn't mean to forget. I, I just didn't remember it. You see, we think of forgetting as passive. But research shows that, that forgetting is anything but passive. It may be subconscious, but is active and intentional. It is a sign of your brain prioritizing other experiences, other behaviors, and other goals. In fact, there's a team of researchers um, at USC that just a couple of years ago uh, did a kind of Pavlovian type experience, or experiment, I should say. Uh, we're all familiar with Pavlov's dogs, and, and, and the bell rings, and, and they get a treat. And over time, anytime the dogs hear the bell ring, they begin to salivate whether or not there is a treat. They're associating the sound of the bell with uh, the treat that is to come. Well, well, these new researchers have some new technology available to them. There is this brain imaging software that allows them to see the connections actually being formed. It's not yet as sophisticated as they would like it to be, and so it really only works on very simple animals uh, like little fish. And, and so they set up kind of a Pavlovian experiment for a fish. And they started by shining a bright light into that fish's tank. And the moment that bright light would shine, they would then flood one side of the tank with very warm water, water that would be uncomfortable to the fish. And sure enough, over time, they found that the moment that light would shine, the fish would swim in the opposite direction in the tank, fleeing in anticipation of the warm water that would flood into his aquarium. Well, well, they went back and they looked at, at the images that were taken of, of this fish's brain processing this new memory. And sure enough, they saw that the moment the fish made this connection, the moment the fish realized that the bright light and the warm water were, were related with one another, it formed a new neural pathway. It formed a new connection, a new memory, and they could see that. In this, in this imaging software, they could see very distinctly this new pathway being formed. But what they didn't expect is that simultaneous with the new pathway being formed, multiple previous pathways and connections dissolved. At the very same time, the fish stored a new memory that impacted its behaviors. Old memories began to dissipate. The fish's brain had specifically and strategically prioritized this new memory and replaced the old ones. And, and I realize when, when I think about forgetting that, that oftentimes this is what's happening to me. Why did I forget about that Italian beef sandwich? Because of all of the other things that were coming to me, all of the other stimulus of that day, remembering to, to preach, uh, meeting people in the lobby, going about the activities to celebrate Brittany, all of these new connections literally dissolved my memory of the gift. And I think the same can be said for how we experience the gospel message. We have heard this story we have heard this promise. We have accepted this truth of Ephesians 2, but we have found ourselves replacing it with new memories. We have found ourselves replacing it with more pressing experiences. We found ourselves replacing the truth of the hope of the gospel, the life and the value that we find in it with more tangible experiences that are happening every day 
in our life. And as I've sat with it this week, I've realized that, that it's actually pretty simple. There are only about three specific types of experiences that cause us to forget. The first two are these internal experiences. How often do we forget the effect of the gospel message because of our own failures, our shortcomings? We find ourselves replacing the truth of, of, of grace in our life because we look at our behaviors and we say, I simply don't live up to this call. How many of us have found ourselves in moments where we're spiritually on fire and we make this game plan for our faith over the course of the next months and years. We say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to read. This is how I'm going to serve. This is how I'm going to give. And, and, and only a few days later, we find ourselves falling short of those goals. And instead of pouring ourselves back into the gospel message, into the truth that it's not because of anything that we have done, we instead enter into a stagnant space of faith where salvation becomes secondary, buried deep in the freezer of our heart. How many times have we looked at our sins, at our shortcomings, We've said to ourselves, God, if you really knew who I was, if you really knew about my addictions, if you really knew what I did behind closed doors, if you really knew about the anger that I harbor in my heart, then you could not possibly claim me as your child. You could not possibly resuscitate me from the death of my transgressions. And so we find ourselves distancing ourselves from this gift. And this distance is called shame. And shame threatens to rob us of the life that God has poured out upon us. Shame threatens to keep us from experiencing the goodness of salvation that lifts us out of the darkness, that claims us in spite of our brokenness. And so many of us forget the impact of the gospel, or we shelve the gospel because we find ourselves so focused, so forming memories on the brokenness that we can't seem to avoid. But you see, the inverse is true as well. We also find ourselves forgetting this gift of the gospel because of our achievements. At one point or another, we have claimed a faith in Jesus Christ, and, and, and we've begun pursuing all of the things that the world tells us we should if we're going to be a, a good Christian. And more often than not, we find that these behaviors and these rhythms stick in our lives. And, and, and from the outside looking in, we've got it all figured out. And, and so we reach this place where we say, God, I'm good from here. I've got it figured out. I've got this good rhythm that allows me to pursue the things that I want while also being marked by a salvation that's found in you. And we become dependent upon the patterns of transformation rather than the God that transforms us. And over time, those patterns become ho hollow. Over time, that transformation seems to slow until we find ourselves in a rut just going by an empty rhythm of life that was once marked by humble dependence upon God. And in this separation, we find ourselves unable to taste the fruit of the gift of God's grace and mercy, this separation that we call pride. Pride, just like shame, separates us from that which God intends to pour out on us. So often, pride and shame cause us to forget the gift that God has poured out freely upon us. So what does it mean for you and I today to recognize that and seek to remember it? If, if these new experiences have caused us to form these new memories that separate us from God, how do we combat that and begin again pursuing a life that is found in the value 
of the hands of our Creator. A few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, before uh, I had kids, Brittany and I uh, went off on a trip with a few other couples to the Leelanau Peninsula in Michigan. Now, I don't expect any of you all to know about the Leelanau Peninsula in Michigan, but in the Midwest, it is kind of seen as, as the pinnacle of, uh, of natural beauty uh, that you can uh, get to within a, a, a short drive of Chicago. Uh, it's, it's this kind of beautiful area that is surrounded by the beaches of Lake Michigan. And the beaches of Lake Michigan, uh, they're so expansive that if you just close your eyes for a minute, you can pretend that you can smell some salt water and it feels like you might be at the Outer Banks, right? Again, this is just a Midwesterner trying to imagine uh, some of the glory of the actual beach. Uh, it, it's a space that's marked by, by beautiful woods and, 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 and natural preserves. And so you can spend all of your time hiking and biking and swimming and kayaking but not only that, it also has these really cute and interesting towns. In fact, one of those towns uh, doesn't allow motor vehicles. It's just horse and buggy. It's, it's very strange. It feels like it's out of the twilight zone. Uh, but, but you can spend your day going about all of these shops and, and, and checking out these different restaurants and, and, and the wineries and vineyards that, that are, are littered all throughout the area. And so as, as young adults living uh, in our late 20s, uh, we really embraced uh, this experience of vacation, and we just filled our day completely chock full with activities. We didn't have to worry about nursing schedules. We didn't have to get back to put our kids down for a nap. There was no whining or complaining or asking uh, how long until we got home. There were uh, no bedtimes, although there probably should have been. Uh, and, and so we just spent all of our time absorbing all that this vacation had to offer. And so at the end of one day that was particularly full, uh, we were sitting together and one of our friends came to the shocking and horrifying realization that she had lost one of her pearl earrings. And it wasn't just any pearl earring. It was a pearl earring that had been given to her on her wedding day from her parents. She was devastated. And we sat there and, and, and kind of lamented in her despair with her because we realized there was no chance we would find that pearl earring with, with all of the hikes and, and all of the kayaking and all the bike riding and all the shops that we had been to that day. And so we kind of just sat there not really knowing what to say or what to do when suddenly it dawned on us that we were millennials on vacation, which meant we had documented every moment of the trip with photographs. And so all of us pulled out our phones and we began skimming through all of the different pictures. And sure enough, because of this catalog of photos, we were able to isolate a two-minute period of time during the day in which that pearl earring had been lost. And we were able to find exactly geographically where we had been. And so we all loaded back up into the car. We drove out to this random field where we had taken these pictures. We found the post that we were standing next to. We got down on our hands and knees. And within 30 seconds, we found the pearl earring. You see, we looked back at a catalog of memories. And because of that, we could isolate a specific moment in which the treasure had been lost. And I wonder what would happen if we did that with our faith. I wonder what would happen if we cataloged every moment of our experience of the gift of God's salvation in our life. I wonder if then we would be equipped to look back and recognize where we had lost sight of it. Look back and recognize where we had replaced a trust in the salvation of a Savior with our own shame and our pride. What does that look like for us as believers to commit ourselves to cataloging our experiences of faith so that they become tangible to us in every moment of our life so that we are constantly reminded of the movement of God's spirit and the gift of his blessings poured out on us. You see, this remembering is a theme in Paul's letters. And sure enough, in, in Colossians 3, we're, we're going to see this theme continue. 
And specifically, we're going to hear an invitation from Paul to catalog God's grace and mercy in every moment of our lives. Paul says, and whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in words, something that you said, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God, the Father, through him. You see, throughout the epistles, we're going to recognize that when we catalog our life with gratitude to God, we find ourselves remembering the gift of his salvation in our life. I will admit that I have found this to be true personally as well. In seasons in which I feel separated from God's grace and seasons in which I feel like my faith life is, is like that clump of clay that's, that's drying out, that's cracking, that's running the risk of becoming dust. I do one simple thing. Each night, I write down three to five places where I saw God show up in my life. And the first nights, it's difficult. Why? Because I, I, I've forgotten about that gift. I've separated myself from that gift but as time goes on, I find myself remembering, and remembering causes me to see. And so each day from that point forward, I find myself more aware of the impact and the transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I have been cataloging the mercy and grace that has been poured out on me. I've been cataloging it with gratitude. And then in those moments where I feel doubt, Rarely doubt in God, but often doubt in myself. Fear that, that I'm not going to live up to the expectations that I have set for myself or the expectations I think that others have set for me. I can turn back to those pages and I can remember, oh yeah, every time that shame has started to spill into my life, God has shown up in real ways. In those spaces where I find myself pursuing a, a faith identity that's found in what I can do, I look through those pages and I remember, oh yeah, every pivotal moment of faith has come when it didn't look like it should on the basis of what I could do because God stepped in. You see, gratitude has the ability to combat our nature that forgets the gifts of God giving thanks for what God does in everything that we do, in everything that we say, closes that separation that is formed by pride, fights off the insecurity that comes with shame, and invites us into a daily transformative relationship with a creator that is forming us and shaping us into something beautiful and yet something useful as well. But you see, those are both internal barriers. Internal barriers that keep us from experiencing the gift of grace and mercy. But there's, there's also one other barrier. A barrier that is oftentimes defined by, by, by the external that drives that wedge of separation between us and God. And in order to understand this barrier, I want to open back up to our Ephesians passage because we're going to learn one more thing about the character of God's gift of grace and mercy. It says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of what? Hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Why did Jesus come in the first place? To be a blessing, not just to one chosen nation, but to all nations. And Paul is writing because he sees the continued separation of this hostility in these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians. And he urges them to recognize that this hostility, this separation, is evidence 
that they have forgotten the gospel message. Because this separation is the antithesis of the peace and the unity that Christ calls us into as the church with our Savior at the head. And I realize that while we don't often at times experience the separation between Jews and Gentiles, we, we do experience separation that's defined by the failures of others. We find ourselves separated by the gift of God because somebody has fallen short of our expectations for them. And sometimes that impacts us in a very real and dramatic way. That we were dependent on them and yet they failed us and that has, has, has wounded our faith. That has caused us to second guess what it is that we're placing our hope in because we had really put our hope in this one person, this one leader, and they fell short of God's glory in a real and public way. We've seen this happen all throughout the church. And what does that do that drives hundreds, if not thousands, of people away from the gospel of Christ? But we also do this in ways that are seemingly less personal and significant. We see the actions of others, and we enter into a space of judgment of them. And we tell them, if you behave that way, if you think that way, if you act that way, then you're not ready for the gospel. Well, guess what? When we find ourselves in patterns of judgment, then when we fall short, it's very easy to subconsciously believe that, that we don't belong either. And so in this space of judgment, we see an erosion of peace, which creates a barrier of division in our hearts with others and with God. You see, in that very same passage from Colossians that talked to us about gratitude, we're also invited to respond to the failures and shortcomings of others as well. Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, when we judge, it very rarely produces transformation in the life of someone else. But it almost always creates division in our heart. It almost always causes us to forget the gift of God's free salvation that he's poured out on us. And so in that space, as a church, what does it look like to forgive and to love unconditionally? Maybe right now there's someone in your head that has done something to hurt you, that has fallen short of your expectations of them. Perhaps it's a family member. Perhaps it's, it, it, it's a friend. Perhaps it's a, a public persona. And I want us to think about what does it mean for us this week to step forward actively in love, to pour out forgiveness in that person. Why? Because in doing so, we remember the truth of the gospel and we invite them into it as well. I know it seems simple, but over and over and over again, Paul articulates that one of the greatest threats to our ability to receive the salvation that comes through faith, through the work of Jesus Christ, grace and mercy is our tendency to forget that he's poured it out on us in the first place. Is our tendency to replace it with these three simple barriers of shame, pride, and judgment. Therefore, let us remember that while we were still sinners, Christ poured out his life for us. Therefore, let us remember that every good thing that we experience is because we are formed as the handiwork of the potter, our creator, that pours out his image upon us and takes that which is, is, is useless and creates purpose and meaning and belonging. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we admit to you that so often, Lord, we find ourselves forgetting the greatest gift that we have ever been given. We find ourselves burying it in the freezer of our heart. And because it's down there, Lord, we never taste its sweetness. We don't live by its life, its purpose, and its peace. We find ourselves building barriers in our heart that keep us from trusting your mercy in lieu of our failures. That keep us from receiving your grace because we are blinded by our achievements. And Lord, that draws us together under the one blessing for all nations because we find our hearts so prone to judgment. And so today, Lord, may we make a commitment to catalog our relationship with you with gratitude and thanksgiving and to find ourselves marked by the love that ties it all together and draws us into unity under our Savior, our Creator, and our God. We pray this in your name. Amen.